Hello everyone, this is Professor Joe Del Russo and this is 10 Tips in 10 Minutes Online Teaching Basics. Now these are things that I've picked up over the years. They tend to work for me, they could work for you. You need to adopt what works for you perhaps and think about all these things in the context of your own teaching style and personality. In any event, let's take a look at the 10 online teaching tips in 10 minutes. First of all, I am very emphatic about this issue. No email ever. I tell my students to always, always contact me through Canvas Messenger. It's really an email client built right into Canvas. And we all use Canvas, obviously, for online, but many professors use it on campus. Remember, when you get direct emails from students, your emails that you receive are commingled with all the other emails that you get whatever source they come from, whether they're personal or professional. There's a lot of clutter in our email inboxes. So rather than miss something, I suggest that you always have students send you direct messages right through the Canvas app. It also makes a record of what students say to you and it keeps it organized. The headers are always included. I've received more than a few emails where students say things like, hi, professor, I'm in your class. Can I bring a friend to the exam or whatever uh, they want to talk about? And you don't know which class they're in. Some of you are teaching three and four classes. You don't know every student. By default, when a student messages you within Canvas, you will see the title of the course and you'll know exactly what class it's from and then you can respond accordingly. The other thing is, anytime a student messages you through Canvas, you get an email anyway, so it'll come to your personal email, but it will also be archived within Canvas Messenger, and that creates a record. Two years from now, when a student represents that they told you that in the seven and a half week online course, they were going to the Caribbean for the last three weeks, you can look it up and say, no, you didn't, or that's not exactly what you said. Maintaining a record of student communications is, I think, critical, and this is a good way to do that. Clearly, you need to spell out what's expected of the students and what they can expect from you in the syllabus. So spell it out in a syllabus. This is something that most professors know rather well, um, but it bears repeating here as well. Redundancy is what's critical when you're spelling out things in a syllabus. And just because it's in the syllabus or it's presented anywhere doesn't mean that they get it, that they read it and absorbed it. Right. So simply because you put something down in the syllabus, don't expect that students, all students will follow that. Many of you know that already from your own experiences. That's why redundancy matters. Rules of engagement. Number three. First of all, there's an announcement tool within Canvas. Announcements, announcements, announcements means offer plenty of announcements. Announcements show that you're engaged with the students. This is really important for the online experience. They want to get a sense of your personality. It works better if they get a sense of your personality. And the way you do that is by communicating with them in a variety of formats and contexts. Announcements is one way to keep them engaged and it doesn't have to be long or involved or anything really profound. Just check in with the announcements maybe once a day, at least every other day. Say things like, I've been reading your discussion board posts and they're really spirited or they're quite interesting. This weekend, there's a big football game on. I wonder how many people are gonna watch it. You don't even have to communicate with them about class materials. Most of the time you will, but the point is keep busy, keep connected with them. This is just good practice for people who have blogs or who have an online presence. Uh, they teach people in marketing Always, always blog if you can. Always post if you can every day, sometimes twice or three times a day. In any event, that's one way to keep connected and engage with the students. When you're addressing students, always say their name. Hello, Kitty. Hello, Danielle. Hello, Michael. Thank you, Michael, for correcting that. Always use first names. This is good practice in every social endeavor. Uh, but certainly when you're responding to them on Canvas and you're teaching an online course, that's one way to show the students that you know who they are, even when you don't. Did I mention redundancy? Really important, really important. This email thing where I emphasize to the students, do not email me, Canvas message me. 
when I tell students that, I tell them that in the syllabus, I tell them that in a separate announcement, and I even make an audio cast, a orientation or welcome to the class for my online classes. I do a new one every semester. And in there, I mention it there as well. And throughout the semester, I mention it again if it comes up in context. Redundancy matters. If there's something you really care about, don't think putting it in a syllabus is good enough. Certainly, it will protect you legally, perhaps, but it will not connect with most students unless you repeat it sometimes two or three times. Do you need to be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week? No, that much is clear. On the other hand, if you expect students to be around doing things at particular times, like taking an exam or doing a mini exam or something that is specific with regard to time, well, then you probably should be around or available by Canvas Messenger or that kind of thing. Uh, but I think it's clear you don't have to be around 24 seven. You should make it clear in your syllabus that you don't always respond right away, but you usually respond within six hours or 12 hours or wherever it is, whatever it is. Discussion boards are real important to help students learn. Many of you use them, you don't have to use them, but if you do use the discussion boards, make sure that you subscribe to them. Students are subscribed by default. By subscribe, I mean you can click a green rectangle, which means that whenever a student posts, it'll be pushed to your Montclair State email. Now, you may not want to, describe to subscribe to all discussion boards, pick your spots, but certainly subscribe to any general board, what we commonly call the Cyber Cafe, because this way when students post there, uh, you'll get it pushed to your email. And if you want, you can subscribe to the discussion boards themselves, the ones that are offered for course credit. When you're creating a discussion board, be provocative. You know, many of you are on social media and you can see the kind of things that get people talking on both sides. In fact, some might argue that we're more polarized than ever, that any particular social media post has 10 naysayers. Well, in the boards, we're not going to get into those kind of social discussions. We want to be provocative in the sense that we get them talking, taking both sides, making informed commentary, dialogue, and argument. And the only way to do that is to create a prompt or discussion forum that engages them in that way. And I don't know what particularly it is, but think about it. Think about, for example, I use corporal punishment. There's still two people on uh, two sides to that story in many people's minds. Uh, we know what the research says, but many people believe it's okay in certain contexts. And that's a very good issue where you're gonna get engaged students responding from both sides of the issue. Don't stress about these boards. You don't have to read every one in great detail. You can scan them. Check in, I say, don't check out. Just scan them. I don't get too rigorous in my grading. Some of you might, and that's okay. The way I handle it is I just give them five points for each board. Some people emphasize the boards. Bear in mind, if you emphasize the boards, you got to read each one thoroughly. And if you have five or six boards, that's a lot of work. And it is, I think, much more easy and effective if you give them great deference when it comes to the boards, as long as they don't do anything that's offensive, as long as they try to make informed observations. Uh, for me, that's good enough. And you don't have to respond or be involved in the board, but every now and then it's okay to, in fact, good practice to check in, just say something every couple of days if a board is active. Well, I call this 2018 10 and one. In order to be more engaged with the students, you should get yourself a $20 headset from amazon.com and do a little mini cast like we're doing now. I call this 10 online teaching tips in 10 minutes. It's hardly gonna be 10 minutes. It's gonna be closer to the 18 minutes that I recommend here, okay? The 18 minute rule simply means that as a prosecutor and an attorney and a litigator, we learned and I learned right away that you can really connect with a jury if you offer whatever you have to offer in the first 18 minutes. Beyond that, most jurors check out. And there's some research that kind of supports this. The bottom line is that's about right, okay? So if you're gonna make a mini cast like I'm making now, do it from 
two minutes to 18 minutes and you'll be okay. Don't over overdo it and don't go over that. What I'm suggesting here is if you buy a $20 headset, you stick it in any computer nowadays, and you can make a little podcast or a little audio cast. The students like that. It's a way to engage with them. Even if you only do one all semester, that's a start because these things have a life of their own. You can use it next semester. So if you're doing a mini cast on juvenile waiver, you do an eight minute presentation, you can record it with PowerPoint, you save it, you pop it up on your Canvas page. Now, some of you may be saying, well, I'm not a tech person. That's a lot of work. It's daunting. It isn't takes 10 minutes to learn you got to want to do it and do it in one take I'm not doing this over I made a few mistakes I will flub a couple of assertions don't waste your time being perfect perfect doesn't sell anyway students want to hear what you have to say and if you say in a way that's say it in a way that's natural see that flub if you say it in a way that's natural it's natural and it's more effective and more engaging get yourself a headset start to let your personality be part of your online course that really matters and i think students embrace it larry and sergey are friends larry and sergey who are they they're the billionaire founders of google probably trillionaires by now and what i mean by that is google it google it if there's an issue you feel dearly about you may know a lot of things about it you're an expert in it you're the teacher right Google it. There's probably a really cool YouTube video. This is to supplement the mini casts that I'm suggesting here. If you go on YouTube, there's a lot of really smart people who do that, who've done it at other universities. Plug it in, post it in your Canvas page. One thing I caution you about, do not, do not overdo it. Just because you can, do not wallpaper your Canvas page with all kinds of YouTube videos. Pick your spots, discretion, brevity, on the other hand, make sure you have good content. Online teaching is about the potential to use multimedia. And the internet's full of really cool things. It doesn't cost a nickel and it takes two seconds to Google it, get the link from YouTube, and put it on your Canvas page. Content is king. When I say let them cheat, we don't want to let them cheat. If you're going to use the online Canvas exam, you have to understand that and not obsess about students te uh, cheating. Students are going to cheat despite our best efforts. We want to minimize their cheating. We want to create roadblocks. And the way I do it, and this may not work for you, but I like it. I give them a 30 minute exam, 25 questions in 30 minutes. And I tell them multiple times, I'm redundant over and over again from the very beginning of the class. I tell them you're going to have 30 minutes to do 25 questions. Now, obviously, if they're special needs students, they get extra time. But most average students, they can do 25 questions in 30 minutes. You know how? Master the material. If they master the material, most students will be done in 18 to 20 minutes. And what this does is I do a closed book exam. I don't let them use their notes or their books. This prevents them from thumbing through their notes or looking through Google or Wikipedia or whatever. Because once they do that, they're doomed because they don't have enough time to do research on the fly. That's my way of minimizing the potential for cheating. I do not stress about cheating anymore. I used to. I don't. And you know what? The pathology of cheaters is they're not prepared anyway. They will fail even at cheating, it seems to me. So don't get too worried about cheating. At least I don't. Not anymore. Here are some things you might want to use in your Canvas online pages. The mini quiz, weighted grading, and the quiz bank. The mini quiz is, now there's some research, I don't really know it completely, but there's some research about every class, every session, or every week, regularly, I would say, giving students mini evaluations. That is asking them a series of questions on chapter one, then next week on chapter two, asking them a series of questions, keeping them engaged, making them express that they understand the materials and those kind of things. Now, I haven't gotten to do that yet, and I'm not sure I ever will, perhaps, but I've adopted this mini quiz. I give a midterm and a final, and I know many of you give papers, and there's all kinds of really creative, interesting things that you professors do to evaluate students um, and I, I think they're great. 
These mini quizzes kind of work for me. I gave two of them in addition to the midterm and the final. I de-emphasize them. They're worth five points or eight points or whatever. And they're just five to eight questions. It gets them used to using the online um, exam tools, taking an exam online and from home. And it's low, lower stress, I would say. It's eight questions. And it gets them thinking about whether they're doing the materials and understanding things. It kind of has them check in on an evaluative uh, level um, at various times during the course uh, that are not at the halfway point at the end that we give the midterm and the final. Something to think about, weighted grading is your friend. Uh, there's a way to do that in Canvas, learn how to do that. If you have discussion boards and they're worth 15% by putting them in the assignments tab, there's a way to make them uh, worth 15%. It's very easy. Once you learn how to use Canvas grading, the grading is simple at the end. If you wing it, it's a nightmare. There's something called a quiz bank. And this really is, you create questions. Let's say you give a 25 question exam. Well, you make 40 questions and you put it in the quiz bank. And then you tell Canvas, select 25 from among those 40 questions. You wanna minimize cheating? The students who take the exam, each student might get five or six different questions because for each student who logs in, it pulls 25 questions from that 40 question quiz bank. We're not gonna learn it here today. I want you to know that there's something that you can do called a quiz bank. Not only does it minimize treating, uh, cheating, it also allows the professor to be more flexible in, in other aspects of delivering online exams. That's something that you wanna learn about, Google it, Canvas has lots of videos that describe how to use the quiz bank that you can find online. And the next semester, maybe you come up with 10 more brilliant questions. So then you add it to the quiz bank on children and memory, for example. Now you got 50 quiz bank questions. And eventually over the years and months, you begin to have a quiz bank that has many, many questions in it. And then you can be more flexible and more interesting in your exams as you move on. Student view is your friend. Yes, it is. When you're designing your Canvas course, make sure every now and then you click on student view and see the perspective of students. You'd be surprised how things might linger that you think you unpublished or hid. Student view is your friend always when making changes and putting your course on for the first time, look at the student view. And I understand that I'm talking in a way that new professors might not know anything about what I'm talking about because you haven't learned Canvas. Well, you got to take a basic course on Canvas and you got to play with it a little bit. But for those of you who've used it and did, on, did online once or twice, I, I think that these tips will be very helpful. Let's look at the last tip. There's an app for that. Yes, there are Android Canvas apps and there are iOS or iPhone Canvas apps. They don't work as well as the website does on your computer or even as the mobile version that you can open in Safari or um, Google Chrome or your phone or your iPad or those kinds of things. But the apps work pretty good. And the SpeedGrader app, the app that both Android and iOS have to grade works really well, really well if you want to grade things mobily or on the fly. I strongly suggest downloading the apps, putting them on the front page of your phone, the home screen of your phone, and you'll see when you get a message from students, by the way, that little notification number will pop up. Yes, there's an app for that, and it works pretty good. There are a couple of little things on the apps where it's hinky, but for the most part, the Instructor, that's the name of the company that owns Canvas, the Canvas apps work really well. And there's two of them, the general app, and then there's the SpeedGrader app that I've worked with. So I hope this is helpful and good luck to you. 10 online teaching tips in 18 minutes. How about that? The 18 minute rule. Perfect. Have a good day.